this is webinar two for the introduction to music therapy course and today's topic is about the use of music throughout history in regards to its place in health leading up to the history of the profession of music therapy. In this webinar we will look at the historical use of music in health up to the development of modern medicine and the development of the profession of music therapy. I'd like to begin with this video, which highlights the use of music. The story of music, successive waves of discoveries, breakthroughs and inventions is an ongoing process. The next great leap forward may take place in a back street of Beijing or upstairs in a pub in South Shields. Whatever music you're into, Monteverdi or Mantovani, Mozart or Motown, Masho or Mashup, the techniques it relies on didn't happen by accident. Someone, somewhere, thought of them first. Music can make us weep or make us dance. It's reflected the times in which it was written. It has delighted, challenged, comforted and excited us. In this series, I'm going to trace music's extraordinary journey from scratch. There'll be no fancy jargon nor misleading labels. Terms like Baroque, Impressionism or Nationalism are best put to one side. Instead, try to imagine how revolutionary and how exhilarating many of the innovations we take for granted today were to people at the time. There are a million ways of telling the story of music. This is mine. that singing would carry throughout the whole subterranean system from these special points, echoing and ricocheting. We also now know that music played an important part in Paleolithic rituals, since whistles and flutes made out of bones have been found in many of these caves. From these dusty artefacts, would one day grow Duke Ellington's horn section and the massed ranks of the Dagenham Girl Pipers. Okay, so this is a great uh, video. If you want to watch the full video, I definitely encourage you to do so. For the purpose of today's class, I just wanted to introduce you to this concept of how music our aspects of music that we take for granted today. In today's society, we can access music pretty much however, whenever we want. Yet that wasn't always the case. And how music played many roles historically, including for communication, as seen at the start of this video with in the caves. And the drawings in those caves were drawn at specific points where there would be the most acoustic value so that people could hear one another and communicate with one another. So that leads us to the preliterate cultures. So what we're talking about here are, is a time when there was complex language, but there was not written communication. So we do need to speculate or a lot of what we of what we read about this time is speculative and based on findings are and uh, and what we know today but in that speculation it really appears that music was a very prevalent force in preliterate cultures and that it was recognized as having effect over both mental and physical well-being. 
It was an important part of medicine as well as religious ceremonies. And those who could engage in music were seen in, uh, with great respect. And these musical engagements were for everybody. So even though they might be led by the medicine man, all people of the community were encouraged to participate in the healing ceremonies. So music wasn't seen as something just for the elite to participate in, but for all people in the community, particularly when it came to religion and health. As we move forward in time to early civilizations, music continues to play an important role in rational medicine as well as continuing to play a part in magic and religious healing ceremonies. And it was even seen with the Egyptian priest physicians that music would be referred to help the soul. It was often included in therapies as part of medical practice. We continue to see this same trend as we move through to ancient Greece and that music continues to be seen as having this impact on thought and again on our physical well-being, on having the ability to impact our emotions. And music was um, also prescribed to those who were deemed as mentally disturbed. So seeing it used as a, as a medicine it was also recognized to provide emotional catharsis. So even individuals like Aristotle and Plato, who were regarded in high esteem, recognized and wrote about the importance of music for emotional catharsis, as well as being medicine for the soul. And this is a great video clip of how music has played a part in health and well-being. Grammarly does more than catch errors. With Grammarly, you can find really good. We live in a society obsessed with music. We use music to worship, tell stories, to celebrate, to work exercise, declare our love, and sometimes our hatred, and arguably, most importantly, to dance. And of course, we play music ourselves because, well, it's a pleasant thing to do. Thousands of years ago, in ancient Greece, when it came to music, things weren't much different. But they might have had lyres and tunics instead of MP3 players and jeans, but the ancient Greeks were just as obsessed with music as we are today. In fact, music was such an important part of ancient Greek society that it makes us seem tame by comparison. To really understand just how integral music was to the ancient Greeks, let's begin by acquainting ourselves with a bit of their mythology. In ancient Greek mythology, it was believed that human creativity was the result of divine inspiration from a group of goddesses known as the Muses. While scholars have argued over the years that there are anything between 3 and 13 muses, the standard number accepted today is 9. Each muse oversees her own specific area of artistic expertise, ranging from song and dance to history and astronomy. It might seem strange to categorise history and astronomy as creative pursuits, but the ancient Greeks saw these disciplines as more than just school subjects. These were the hallmarks of civilization in what, to their eyes, was a pretty barbaric world. An educated, civilized person was expected to be proficient in all aspects of creative thought inspired by the muses, and the common medium through which these disciplines were taught, studied, and disseminated was music. You see, it's no coincidence that the word muse is very similar to the word music. It's where the word originates. Poetry be it a love poem or an epic poem about a dragon slaying hero, was sung with a musical accompaniment. Dancing and singing, obviously, were accompanied by music. Theatre was always a combination of spoken word and music. History was recounted through song. 
Even the study of astronomy was linked to the same physical principles as musical harmony, such as the belief held by many Greek thinkers that each of the planets and stars created their own unique sound as they travelled through the cosmos, thrumming like an enormous guitar string light years long. However, music pervaded more aspects of their lives than just education. Ancient Greeks considered music to be the basis for understanding the fundamental interconnectedness of all things in the universe. This concept of connectivity is known as harmonia, and it's where we get the word harmony. Music was used as a form of medicine to treat illnesses and physical complaints, as a vital accompaniment to sporting contests, and as a means to keep workers in time as they toiled away on monotonous or menial tasks. One of the most important applications of music in ancient Greek society is found in the belief that music can affect a person's ethos. A word we still use today, ethos is a person's guiding beliefs or personal ethics, the way that one behaves towards oneself and others. The Greek philosopher Plato, one of the most famous and influential Greek thinkers at the time, asserted that music had a direct effect on a person's ethos. Certain kinds of music could incite a person to violence, while others could placate a person into a benign, unthinking stupor. According to Plato, only very specific types of music were beneficial to a person's ethos. One should only listen to music that promotes intelligence, self-discipline and courage, and all other kinds of music must be avoided. Furthermore, Plato fervently denounced any music that deviated from established musical conventions, fearing that doing so would lead to the degradation of the standards of civilization, the corruption of youth, and eventually, complete and utter anarchy. While Plato's fears can seem extreme, this argument has appeared in modern times to condemn musical trends such as jazz or punk or rap. What do you think Plato would say about the music you listen to? Is it beneficial to your ethos? Or will it degenerate you into a gibbering, amoral barbarian? Okay, so I think this is a great example of how the use of music for wellness is not a new concept. It is something that has been a part of human history since the beginning of time. And the fact that it has now developed into a pro profession in today's world, being music therapy, the actual concept itself is not new. And the idea that music can play a role in so many various areas is not new. And also how society has views around what kind of music is good or bad or will promote well-being, will make you a good person or a bad person. These ideas still exist today. For example, when Elvis Presley first came to the forefront, uh, it was seen that rock and roll was the devil's music, for example. And that if you listen to that music, you're um, you know, basically, you've sold your soul to the devil. And, and so recognizing how we have different preconceived notions about music, and in the field of music therapy, the idea is to do away with such preconceived notions and to individualize how music is used in relation to the individual, to the client in the session. So again, not looking for prescription, not looking to make these generalized terms about what kind of music is good or not good or helpful or not helpful but about what kind of music is going to have the desired impact for the individual depending on their healthcare goal. And uh, as we continue to move forward, I wanted to highlight that even today, when an individual becomes a medical doctor, they take the Hippocratic Oath. And so this connection to ancient Greece continues even today in the medical world and that a doctor takes the Hippocratic Oath swearing by the Apollo physician the by Apollo and I wanted to point out that Apollo 
was not only the god of healing and medicine, but also of music, and he was the leader of the muses. And so I just think it's interesting to bring this full circle of how music still plays a role or is still being highlighted in our medical world today as part of the Hippocratic Oath. And as we moved forward through history and moved away from magic and the gods, that um, medicine began to be influenced by the four cardinal humors. So blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. However, music still kept appearing throughout um, history at this time still in being recognized as having power over um, human morals and having positive impact on individuals. So even though, again, we're moving away from, um, from magic and we're moving away from religious ceremonies and medicine is becoming more uh, based on, at this time, the four cardinal humors, music is still showing to be a part of, or still still appearing in, um, in its use for health and well-being. And we continue to see that as we move on into the Renaissance, and the four cardinal humors continue to be the base for medical, um, the, the base of medicine, and we still see music being used. Music is being prescribed actually as preventative medicine. So during this time, uh, many ep epidemics were um, having a, a, a very large negative impact on many communities. And many people were in need of uh, positivity and optimism. And it was seen that by prescribing music and encouraging people to engage in music, that optimism could be, in, um, could be brought forward. People could be inspired to persevere. And this was really important during this time. And as we get closer and closer to modern day, uh, we see that music still is playing a part. Uh, so individuals like Kircher was proposing that music should be used and it should be used with intent and matching people's personalities or people's characteristics. And so sad music should be played for people who are feeling sad and happy music for people who are playing happy. So this does not quite align with how we use music in music therapy today, but just to point out that people were thinking about the use of music in this way and using it for depression, for example, and physicians such as Louis Rager was, was um, or published a book about the effects of music on the human body. So all of this to say that the use of music in health and well-being, or this concept of music therapy, is not a new idea. It's been with us throughout time. And the first uh, publication uh, that is uh, that has been recognized as being a, a, a music, most related to music therapy, is an article published in 1789 um, by an unknown author in Columbian Magazine. And it was entitled, Music Physically Considered. And what was particularly different about what this author wrote is that the practitioner should be trained in how to use music. And this is, this is the basis of the creation of the profession of music therapy in that one must be trained in the elements of music, the various aspects of how to use music in order to best meet the need of somebody else. And wanting to highlight that 
Um, going into the 19th century, there have been many articles in music journals, medical journals, and psychiatric periodicals about the use of music and health, and that there have been many programs in schools and hospitals that implemented music to support individuals, as well as research that took place, for example, um, on Blackwell Island, now known as Roosevelt Island, where an inpatient uh, facility, uh, there was a, an inpatient facility there, and a whole research study was completed about bringing live music to the inpatients and the impact that that had for the well-being of the patients. So, Again, historically, we have many examples of the use of music for well-being. And um, it was after the Second World War in the United States, many of the soldiers who came back who were in hospital were not responding to the medical care that they were being given. And when I say not responding, what I'm talking about is their mental well-being. And the term post-traumatic stress disorder wasn't a term at that time, but it appears that that is what we're talking about. We're talking about soldiers coming back from the Second World War who were dealing with the traumatic experience. And musicians were going into the hospitals and doctors were observing the positive impact for the patients that were otherwise struggling to were, were struggling with their well-being and this was really the launching pad for the profession of music therapy in the states and really across the world it was from these these experiences that the medical profession observed that uh, monies were provided to do research and uh, there was a particular project called the soldier project research and where evidence was gathered to support training individuals to use music for healthcare goal. And as a result of that, the very first music therapy training program was established at Michigan State University in 1944. And in 1950, the National Association of Music Therapy was established. And that is the first association to regulate the profession of music therapy. So that's where it all started as an actual profession and the rest of the world started to take um, to to uh, to follow suit from from there. Uh, in Europe, uh, in England specifically, we saw Juliet Alvin, a, a cellist, where her work with children with autism started a, um, was the motivator for the British Society of Music Therapy and for their first training program, which was at Guildhall in London, England in 1968. And as the programs developed in the States and in England, the uh, profession began and the training program spread across uh, Europe and then the European Association of Music Therapy was established in 1989. Um, and I think it's also important to highlight that music therapy um, was recognized in uh, 1976 by the British government. And um, their association is now called BAMPT, the British Association of Music Therapy. And... Uh, so when we're talking about music therapy growing across Europe, all of these different countries were involved with the European Association of Music Therapy by the 1970s. And since 2005, um, we've had even further uh, countries involved. So Canada, a little bit later on, wasn't until the 1970s, that Norma Sharp, a music therapist who was working in St. Thomas, Ontario, 
Now, she was calling herself a music therapist. There actually wasn't any music therapy training programs in Canada as of yet, but she was using music to support people's health in a psychiatric hospital. And she wasn't aware, or she wanted to know, how many other people are doing this kind of work? How many people across Canada are using music to support healthcare goals? Not having access to the internet at that time, uh, she was writing uh, letters to other hospitals to find out if there were other people like herself. And as a result of her reaching out to see what was the landscape of music therapy in Canada, she um, initiated the first gathering of music therapists. And that took place in London, so that became the first conference of music therapists and led to the formation of the Canadian Music Therapy Association, Association in 1974. Today it's referred to as the Canadian Association of Music Therapists. So that is how in Canada it was the small group of music therapists that came together who recognized that they were all doing similar work, that it needed to be regulated, people, and they needed to find a way to support each other. So again, the association was established in 74, and then the first training program began in 1970, it also began in 1974 um, in British Columbia at uh, Capilano University in BC. And as mentioned, uh, now today it's the CAMT, and, um, and also recognizing that in today, if you're a music therapist in Ontario, using the act of psychotherapy, that you must also be recognized by the CRPO, and I also wanted to mention that the Music Therapy Academy was launched in 2016, and that is um, an organization in Canada that I founded that provides professional development to music therapists, as well as to others in the community and other healthcare professionals to learn how to use music within their own scope of practice. So as mentioned, since the, the states, the profession of music therapy has continued to grow and each country has developed its own associations, or many countries have developed their own associations, and the World Federation of Music Therapy was then developed in 1985. And they also um, launched a open access journal called Voices. And so this is an international music therapy journal that you can find online. And it's a great resource that anybody can access about research being done around the globe about music therapy. Okay, so if you were to be asked on a quiz or a midterm, a question about something being music therapy, you should hopefully be able to determine. So, is this an example of music therapy? Now, doctors in Denmark say they have conclusive scientific proof that music helps to reduce the perception of pain and to speed up patient recovery. As Malcolm Brabant reports, they claim they can reduce the level of tranquilizers given to intensive care patients. The music is permanently on in this intensive care unit. The result has been that patients require less sedation and their recovery times have improved. You can close your eyes, all right, but you cannot close your ears. And man has been developed to, to, to be able to hear during dreams, during sleep. And uh, we know that hostile environment, like alarms you can hear in the background, interferes with the cure because the interaction of, uh, of the brain the body is very important for the cure which comes from within but placing patients in a non-hostile friendly fantasy stimulating environment will enhance cure it's been assumed for quite some time that music is good for your health but the process has been rather hit and miss until now 
because what has happened is that a composer has come up with scientifically designed music that's specifically targeted at the body. And this is the composer behind Music Cure. Neil's eye is constantly refining the music to match the scientific parameters required by the doctors in a unique collaboration between medicine and art. The rhythm we all, all of us has from the beginning of life is the heartbeat of the mother. And in a, by a pregnant woman, the heartbeat is around 60 beats a minute. So we took that as a test and created the music around this basic life-giving rhythm. And the results was actually breathtaking. The researchers are now exporting their expertise, and they believe music therapy would have immediate psychological benefits in countries with poor hospital facilities. I think it's very important for the rest of the world that they focus on this, because it's inexpensive, it has no side effects, and it's universally applicable. So will music ever be able to replace painkillers or anaesthetics? The Danes think not. But the music therapy team has identified the brain's hidden potential for self-cure. And the researchers are now on a journey of exploration to see what other magic lies within. Malcolm Brabant, BBC News, Copenhagen. Okay, so you will have noticed that they used the word music therapy to describe this project. And it's and it was also written there as the music therapy project. However, uh, hopefully, even by the end of webinar two, you can, you can see that this is not an example of music therapy. And actually, they have inaccurately used the word music therapy in that video. So why is that? So reason number one is that there is actually no music therapist who is a part of that music therapy project. They are not guiding it, they are not informing it, they are not facilitating the music. So right away, we can be very clear that this is not music therapy because music therapy, by definition, is facilitated by a music therapist. And um, now, however, this is an example of how music can be therapeutic and music can be helpful. And it's showing how music has been, how, how one can think about using music meaningfully. So thinking about the beat and thinking about how it would be delivered and looking at the responses on the monitors to ensure that it's having a positive impact. So this is all really good stuff and a really great example of how music can be used in a helpful way, but it's not an example of music therapy. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that the music itself is not being directed in any way by the client. So in this particular music therapy project, or what they call a music therapy project, the, it is the composer and the doctors that are choosing the instrument and the genre genre of music. And so I just invite you to think for a moment, if you were one of those patients and somebody chose the music that you are going to be exposed to and you cannot verbally say that you like it or don't like it and you physically cannot turn it off, One would, well, that's, a, that's a lot of, um, a lot to, for the composer and the, and the doctor, it's a lot for them to assume that this is something you will like. And so granted, through using the, the heart rate measures and looking at the machines and how you're responding, hopefully it's giving a good measure of whether or not this is uh, having a positive impact. But again, I invite you to think about being in that position where you cannot speak or verbally or physically move and you're hearing an instrument that maybe you really don't like. 
Maybe you don't like the sound of that instrument. Maybe you don't like the sound of classical music. Um, perhaps that particular instrument, um, somebody that you really didn't like when you were in band, that's the instrument that they played. And now it's evoking memories of that person in a negative relationship. And those are the kinds of things that we think about in music therapy. So the music therapist is trained to think about what or how might this music impact the individual? How is it individualized to them? How might it evoke different memories? How can we be sure that what it's evoking is positive? So we have to be really cognizant of how we use music. And again, I think the example in this video is, is a great way of using music and it can have lots of wonderful benefits. I just wanted to share it with you as showing you the difference between the music therapy lens of using music and music medicine. And the video I shared with you just now would be an example of music medicine. I also wanted to point out to you in talking about the development of the profession of music therapy that historically music has been a part of education, of medicine, used by physicians and nurses as part of uh, cognition, learning, and that in the field of music therapy, in the training programs, that music therapy is informed by all these various aspects because so many other professionals are already using music in their work. And music therapy is bringing a lot of these different pieces together. And I, I like to provide the example of the alphabet and how we learn the alphabet. And I think this is a great example of how music facilitates learning. I would guess very confidently that nobody watching this webinar has learned the alphabet in any other way than through a song. I don't think that anybody went to school and in kindergarten the teacher said, okay kids, today we're going to learn the first five letters of the alphabet. Now there's a lot of letters in the alphabet, over 20. So it's a lot to learn. So we're only going to start with the first five, okay? So we're going to memorize A, B, C, D, and E. Repeat after me, kids, okay? We're going to practice those five letters. Now, it seems rather ridiculous because we've all learned the alphabet, all the letters in one girl. We learned all of them because we just learned a song. And by learning that one song, we learned all of the all of the letters of the alphabet. But the reality is that's a lot of learning for little people. That's a lot of letters for a very young person to learn. And the idea of breaking it down and into small chunks without music seems crazy because we know how easy it is to learn all the letters if we learn it in a song. And so this concept of learning through song is not new. We, I'm pretty sure we all learned the alphabet through a song. And many concepts that we learn is through music. So counting backwards, for example, something like, um, Five little ducks went out one day over the hills and far away. Mother duck said quack, 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 but only four little ducks came back. Four little ducks. And on it goes until three and two and one or no little ducks come back. Or um, ten monkeys jumping on the bed and one falls off. And then nine monkeys jumping on the bed and one falls off. Eight monkeys. So all these different songs. We're practicing cognitive concepts. And music therapists take this same idea and depending what the healthcare goal is, if we're working on rehabilitation of cognitive goals, on speech, 
um, on self-expression. We're bringing these concepts into songs and creating songs to help facilitate that goal. And we've seen how effective that is just in our regular education that um, takes place uh, predominantly. Uh, yeah. Yes, how we already are using music for learning. Now in Western culture, suddenly it becomes not cool to sing once we become like age 9, 10, grade 4, grade 5. And so we don't see so much singing and learning anymore. And this is really unfortunate because it still is a very effective tool. But for some reason, as we become older in Western culture, we are taught that certain people are good singers and certain people should only sing in the shower or you know your sister is a good singer but you're really good at sports and we become categorized into being a musician or not a musician where in reality all human beings can participate in music and a really great example of that talking about western culture and the use of music is that all of these stereotypes about who can and cannot sing music, um, these ideas of, oh no, I cannot sing in public, all of these ideas completely go out of the window when it's somebody's birthday. If I was to say to you, if we were all in a room together, and I was to say, oh, um, it's my birthday today, pretty much everybody in the room would sing happy birthday to me without thinking, Mm, I'm not going to join in in singing that song because I'm not a good singer or oh no I don't sing happy birthday because um, I don't sing in public. We tend not to have those thoughts when it comes to singing happy birthday because it is socially acceptable that no matter your musicality, your musicianship, what training you have or don't have, how good of a singer you apparently are, it's understood and that we are all accepted to sing happy birthday. So I really like sharing that example of how culture impacts how we engage in music. And in the music therapy sessions, this the music therapy space, regardless of age and stereotypes and preconceived notions, is a space for the individual to participate in music, not as a musician, not for music lessons, not for a musical goal, but just purely as a human engaging in their natural, uh, engaging naturally in music because all humans have the capacity to do so. And then using that capacity to engage in music to facilitate the healthcare goal. That brings us, to, brings us to the conclusion of webinar two. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. There is also a link on Avenue to a video reviewing the history of music therapy, as well as a video about the history of music reviewing some of the concepts we spoke about today and providing a few other examples.